Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Street You Grew Up On, presented by Walmart's Black and Unlimited. So this is a very special episode because Walmart's Black and Unlimited is a platform focused on supercharging the unlimited potential of Black people and our communities by supporting Black creators and businesses. On Street You Grew Up On, we come together to unfold our common humanity and reaffirm that every person is the lead character in the story of their own lives. And it all starts on the streets and the communities they grew up in. Our guest is not only a beautifully brilliant artist and creator, she's also a phenomenally successful business owner. I am so excited to talk with Taraji P. Henson about the street she grew up on where she discovered her love for the arts and hair care and business and all the things. So come watch and then stay tuned for more episodes coming soon. Thank you so much for being in conversation with me on Street You Grew Up On. I'm really excited to talk to you. So the way that we like to learn about the name of the street a person grew up on is to find out your sexy alter ego name. So that yeah. is the name of your first pet is the first name and the last name is the street you grew up on. Patsy Livingston. And my mother was annoyed. Yeah, my mother was annoyed that it was a dash hound too. Little. Oh, the, the like the hot dog dogs. And my mother was a little offended that I named the dog Patsy because that's my grandmother's name and she's dark skinned. So she thought I was naming the dog after my grandmother. <laughs> Were you? I don't remember. I don't think so. I just think I <laughs> like the name. <laughs> oh, I love that. So, so Livingston Road, Livingston Street, Livingston Avenue. Livingston Road. Livingston Road. Did you Livingston. grow up in a house or an apartment? No, it was garden apartments in Southeast Washington, D.C. Yeah, ah. it wasn't the best neighborhood. <laughs> uh huh. It wasn't um, the projects, but it was low income, you know, and, um, you know, that's just what my mother could afford at the time. But in, in my mind, I lived like a princess. Like I had the best. Yes. She always dressed my room up really good. Like it would be like strawberry shortcake or whatever the theme cartoon was. My room always looked like a princess room and I had the matching curtains and the sheets. So I, she actually really, even though we didn't have a lot of money, I didn't know it. You know what I mean? Right. Because I, right. was, I was just happy. I was happy and I had the toys that I liked to play with and you know, on the weekends, she did a really good job with keeping me away from the elements of the hood. Like, even though I grew up in the hood, I was still like sort of like a valley girl because on the weekends she would send me to the suburbs to stay with my cousin. And they were like one of two black families in an all predominantly white neighborhood. So I was like the kid that you could put anywhere and I would get along with anybody. Oh, wow. So who my was in the house on Livingston? Was yeah, it, it was you and your mom? Just me and my Just mom. Just you two. No siblings? No siblings. I was the only child until my dad remarried and had my little sister, but I'm 17 years older than me. So, um, so tell me what, like, what did this house look like? Was it a, a was a garden? Yeah, so it was like um, a huge complex. It was like, it was almost shaped like a big U, the complex. And let's just call it, you had the east side and the west side. And then you had this hill, these steps that you go up and you had other garden apartments up there. But they were all the same. It was like, you know, two level, two story, um, four units in each building. And they were just like stacked around like this. And they, and they had a courtyard outside where we would play. The kids, we would run around this little grass that had a rail around it. <laughs> I was the but, same in my my in my neighborhood. It was like because I'm the same. I always say to people, I didn't grow up in the projects, but I grew up across the street from the projects. So same right. difference, right? Yeah. And we had a giant lawn, but it had these metal poles with like chains in between the people off the grass. Yes, we never played on the grass. We always stayed on the sidewalk around it, and we would skate and skate around and play tag and. My mom was cool with me going outside, but she had to be able to see me. Like I couldn't go like with the other kids. I couldn't go up to the playground in the back. And I think her fear was on point because she got robbed twice in this same complex. Oh, were there a lot of kids your age in the neighborhood? 
Yes, a lot of kids my age. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't allowed to go over other people's houses and they weren't allowed to come over my house. But it was just this one family where I was allowed to go over there and they were allowed to come over my house because her and the mom, they kept in touch. You know, she just trusted them. But yeah, yeah, I was a good kid. I would go home and like my mom said, you go in, you close that door. You don't answer the door for anybody. That's right. You lock all the locks. We had four locks locks on the door. And wait until I come home. Yeah. (laughs) Now, when you were home, I know for me, I used to do a lot of like video music box and watch a lot of mm-hmm. sitcoms like the Jeffersons. Were, like, did you watch movies? Did you read? Were you watching oh. television? What did you do when you were at home? I loved comedy. I loved watching um, Carol Burnett was like. Oh. I did not miss an episode. Even to this day, I have her all the box CD of the entire series. I was a huge Carol Burnett fan. Huge. Wow. I never know. That explains because I thought you when you did the performance of Miss Hannigan, that's a mm-hmm. role I love so much. And I felt yeah. like you honored like you made it entirely your own, but you also Thank honored you. her comic genius yeah. in it. And you now are. I see where that connection came from. I studied that woman. My mother would be like, sit down, your daddy's not made a glass, because I would stand in front of the television. <laughs> I will watch her every <laughs> facial expression. Same thing with Lucille Ball. I love the elasticity of her face. She could make her face do anything. So I studied her. Um, I watched lots of Betty Davis. I love Betty Davis. Um, and anything that had black people. <laughs> anything. anything that had anybody black, I was watching it. I'd watch Flip Wilson. Yeah, uh-huh. watch Flip Wilson, um, you know, um, Solid Gold, and when they would have the black entertainers yes. and artists come on. So that was me. I was that kind of kid. I love the upbeat, funny shows. And I guess because, you know, when you're living in the hood, you need to laugh, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and typically when I grew up, because, you know, that's when crack was dropped off in the hood. And yeah. I saw families yeah. destroyed, like kids that were coming from homes with both parents ended up looking like my situation. Like one mm. parent probably was strung out on drugs and then the other, you know, I remember yeah. one girl ended up knocking on my door and it was weird. It was a weird hour. And I was like, what are you doing? My mother, we were like, what's he? Why are you here? Her brother and her mother ended up getting strung out on drugs. She literally oh. became home and dropped out of school in the seventh grade. Like it was bad. We oh. watched the entire neighborhood shift. How did your mom, I mean, now when I think about what your mom did with your bedroom, like what a beautiful gift that all of this stuff was mm-hmm. happening in the neighborhood, but she created this little palace for you, this sanctuary of safety and beauty in your bedroom. What else was happening in the home that you remember? Like, was there a lot of music? Did she use music to maintain the environment? Did she cook? Did you cook? Oh, God. Yes, my mom cooked. She's a, from the South, woman from the South. So I, I always got incredible meals. The only meal I hated, but it always smelled so good, was liver. I would smell the liver and I would always be like, oh, mom, I think I can do it this time. It smells like steak. And then I would taste it and be like, what? It's, it's the texture, right? Isn't it the texture that's just off? Yeah. It's just like powder. Yeah. It's so pungent. Yeah. The taste yeah. is so pungent. And I was like, yeah, I've never been a liver fan. I couldn't do yeah. it. Yeah. 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 What else did she make that you really loved? My grandmother's still alive. She's about to be 100 in April. And oh so, my goodness, God yeah, bless. She, yeah, she's still spry. She's a, she got a little attitude with us because we won't allow her to drive. Um, <laughs> no, oh, I honey, hope I'm that spunky. Me too, because she is something else. But my grandmother makes this um, barbecue chicken and everybody, like my grandmother is a, an amazing cook still to this day. She makes from scratch these pineapple upside down cakes. And so oh. we are all trying to perfect her <laughs> um, recipes, yes. especially, yes. especially the barbecue chicken, because it's not barbecue like sweet, smoky barbecue. It's barbecue. It tastes more like pulled pork, but it's chicken. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And so we have all throughout our own life, our adult life, all the cousins, everybody in the family tries to re- recreate that recipe. <laughs> Nobody can do it quite like grandma. I mean, mom is pretty good, but no one tastes like grandma's, you know. <laughs> Everyday actions can make everything change. Visit walmart.com slash black and unlimited to learn more. 
I was thinking about talking to you this morning and I was remembering, I remember standing in the Boys and Girls Club in my neighborhood oh, and my mm -hmm. mom holding the book, The Color Purple, because she was wow. reading it. Wow. And it was, it was the first, I think I remember it because I said to her like, I want to read that. And she said to me, not yet, but mm. soon. Um, mm. And so it was the first book that I thought like, oh, there's some books that are just for grownups. Like there's something in there she doesn't want for me yet. And I, I think mm -hmm. I read it when I was 12. Uh -huh. But I was thinking about you and wondering if, because you're so brilliant in the movie, your performance you. is so extraordinary. I wore Thank purple you. today for you. And, um, you. and I was wondering like, did you, watch that movie? Was that one of the films? When you talk about you watch anything with black people, like, do you remember the first time you saw the movie or did you read the book or how did it play in your childhood, in your home? I saw the movie first and I just remember seeing all of those black people. And that was a time in my life when I was starting to go, I think I like this acting thing, you know? Ah. And I was a very rambunctious child. I had a lot of energy and very I creative. I you yourself zany. You were zany. I was very zany. I, you know, <laughs> I was bouncing off the walls. And I'm just grateful that I had, you know, family members, especially my father who recognized that. Once he realized I wasn't an athlete, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you know, he didn't have a boy. <laughs> so he was trying to make me the sport. And I, he put me on this basketball team and those girls rolled their eyes at me so hard because I was horrible. <laughs> And I'm out there with two left feet and all thumbs. And I'm like, Dad, this is not, I don't think I'm an athlete. And he was like, you're right. <laughs> he, he had to We agree. tried, though. I did it. I would do anything to please my daddy. But once he realized it was the, it was the, performance, the performer in me, he kind of honed in on that and nurtured it and as from a young age. And so did my aunt and my godmother. They put me in this... Um, this program at the Kennedy Center for youth, for acting and the performing arts. And so I started getting really serious about it. And that's when I saw the color purple and I was like, oh, I want to do that. That's what I want to do. <laughs> and I wanted to work like that. But it's interesting that I saw the movie and then later in college, I read the book. Because it's interesting, you go to these public schools and they don't teach you our history. I didn't learn. No. I'm grateful that I went to an HBCU because that's where mm -hmm. I learned about being all things black. And yes. that's where I learned to have pride in who I was as a black woman. And like, I didn't learn that in public school. <laughs> so was there any of that in your home, too? Like, did your parents talk to you about being black and um, instill any pride in you? My father did. My father was like one step away from being a Black Panther, hence my name, Swahili. Uh, you know, it, um, Hope Love, Taraji Pender mm. means Hope Love in Swahili. Um, mm. But yeah, my dad ordered dashikis and he was really proud. <laughs> you know, my mom, it's not that my mom wasn't, she was proud, but she was, um, she was trying to make ends meet. You know yeah. what I mean? My mother yeah. worked She was really in the day to day. Hard. Mm -hmm. She was in the day to day. She was making sure the bills got paid. I had something to eat. And so she was literally wrapped up in. But there was love like she loved me yes. and things yes. like that. But, you know, it's hard when you're you got a kid. You're that's, you know. So, yeah, you, you talk about your dad always knowing that you would be a success, like being one of your early, early cheerleaders. Yeah. Um, was he, but your parents weren't together, right? They split when I was two. And, you know, my dad had his issues and it took him a minute to get his bearing and his, cause he was homeless for some time. But the beautiful thing I loved about my father is that he never hid anything from me. The, uh, he showed me the highs and lows. He was very transparent. But the beautiful thing about living and being granted the breath of life the next day is that you can change the course. Is it was it that journey of getting to see your father's ups and downs that made you co-found this beautiful foundation, the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation? And yeah. and can you talk a little bit about like mm -hmm. kind of what in your childhood inspired you to want to build that foundation and that support for other people? Just seeing you know, my community hurting in distress. 
out of my own necessity as an adult looking for therapy for me and my son. And it's like, mm. where do we go? Like I was, and who looks like us and who can I trust and who will my son trust if they don't look like us? And mm. it became a real um, struggle. And I remember calling my best friend since the seventh grade. She runs my foundation. Tracy Jenkins runs my foundation. Um, she suffered from panic attacks and and depression and anxiety since we were little. And we used to laugh about it then because we were ignorant. And now the same things that we laughed about, we cry about now because we were so ignorant, you know? Mm. And we just mm. wanted to do something about it. And, you know, I'm privileged. Like I can afford therapy for me and my son. And then I just sat there and thought, look, I can find a therapist. Great, great for me and my son. But what about the entire community that one, we don't even talk about it. And two, yeah. Can't access it. Don't have the money or the funds. And where do I go? You know, because mm -hmm. we don't talk about it. When you talk about mental wellness with the black and brown community, you have to be careful because it's not like, oh, OK, I'll just find a therapist. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Not the taboo. Like the first thing was like, we just got to get people comfortable about talking about it. And that's why. You know, I shared my struggles when I went to the floor of Congress because I felt like. You know, sometimes they look at us and think, oh, their life is perfect because they make money and they're doing They've what they love. It. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what you don't understand is like the great guru, you know, the notorious B.I.G. said more money, more problems. And he never <laughs> lied. <laughs> That's <laughs> you know? right. I'm just so proud of the work we're doing. And every time I hear another athlete or another artist, especially our black men, go public about their healing, I call my best friend. I'm like, girl, we did that. Yeah, because <laughs> you're giving people permission. You're giving people yeah. permission to be in their truth. For us, it's all because we always about being strong and be a strong black man and be a strong black woman. And those are the tropes that are killing us. <laughs> yes, yes. So I one of the other things I want to talk to you about, because I think you do this really beautiful job of being vulnerable publicly and saying, like, I'm not perfect. I'm human, I'm struggling, I'm a working mom, I'm all these things. And yet you always look flawless, <laughs> right? In a good way, right? Like you're say, you're, you let people see the real you, but you also are not afraid to bring your most beautiful self forward and to like uh -huh. take up space with your beauty in the world. Dude. And so I wanted to ask about that in terms of your childhood, because I'm going to I'm going to ask you about TPH by Taraji P. Henson. But mm -hmm. I want to know, like, where did your interest in beauty and fashion start? Was your mom interested in yeah. hair and makeup? And did you used to as a little girl get into her stuff or what was that like in your home? It was all my mom. Oh, she was such a girly girl. And she had her girlfriend circle and they would come over and she had one girlfriend who loved shoes. And whenever she would come over, she would have a suitcase. Like if she stayed over, she would have a suitcase full of shoes. And I was just always in the room. And absolutely, I would go. There's this famous picture of me and I had just played in my mother's makeup. And I had to be like seven or eight and I had the blue eyeshadow and the dark yes. brown lipstick yes. with the brown lip liner. <laughs> <laughs> I need this picture. My mother said I started attempting to do my hair as early as the first grade. And um, she wow. made me stop because I was putting pigtails and, and um, rubber bands and it was tearing my hair out. So she <laughs> made me stop. And so I think I took ownership of my hair because my mother, I would drive her mad because she would she would do my hair. She was really good at cornrowing. And I would be like, well, I mm. want it all this side going like this. And then I want like a, a thing right here and then yes, do this yes, side. Like, yes, she would be yes, like, yes. At the ninth grade, I taught myself to use the Marcells. You know, the, the, yes, the, 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 in the oven. iron. Yes. yes. And I bought my own oven and I just started learning how to curl my own hair. And I started doing my own hair. That's from the ninth grade on. I was doing my own hair. Discover the beauty of black lead brands because our products and stories are for everyone. Visit walmart.com slash black and unlimited to learn more. But your products are so beautiful because they're so great for styling, but you can tell you're also really invested in the health of black oh. hair and textured hair. Did that start then? Like when you were using the hot irons, were you trying to balance that on the weekends with a with a heat cap or like were you were you thinking about those things back then? 
I actually started thinking about it more when I moved when I moved to LA and started working professionally. Mm. Um, that's when I started thinking about it because now I'm doing my hair more often. You know, um, like more hands are in my hair, more products, and all of that. So then I was, you know, I got to Hollywood and I heard about all of these stories about, oh Lord, I lost all my edges, and I was like, I don't want to lose my edges. Like, how do I not lose my edges? Uh-huh, you know. Uh-huh. So, I came into the industry thinking, how do I protect my hair? The first thing, like a man, I wore my hair. And everybody was like, oh my God, your hair looks so healthy. What do you do? And I couldn't explain it in 141 characters. So I was like, <laughs> I, think I, will, I think there's a something here. You know, there was a, a real problem that needed to be solved. I didn't hear anyone really talking about scalp care. And I was like, maybe women should know about taking care of their scalp. Because I knew. <laughs> I was taking care of my scalp, you know, and I was like, "Hmm, maybe I can share this with other women. And so that's how TPH came about. And then we launched during the pandemic. And I'm always into um, luxuriating. That's what I call it. Luxuriating. And because that's a part of mental wellness, you know, Mm self-care, self-care. And so TPH falls under that umbrella because it's literally about luxurious luxury products at an affordable price and spa like treatments. Being in this new role as not just an artist, but an entrepreneur and being, you know, like celebrated and so successful that you're in Walmarts all over the country. Like, Do you have advice that you would give to other entrepreneurs who are like, I want to be, I want to get in Black and Unlimited. I want to have that kind of platform, that kind of access. Like, what would you say to other Black entrepreneurs? What I would say is whatever your product is and, and you, you are the prize. You have the thing that we need that the consumer wants be careful who you partner with and make them all audition for you oh do not be so eager to partner with the first person because you've been trying to sell this thing and for so long make them dance for you because you mm. have the product you are I wish that. I, know your value know your know value. your value no do not sell yourself short because no one's going to care about your product the way you will so make sure you get in bed with the right partners. I wish someone told me that. Mm. You you feel like you had to learn it through your own like journey. Yeah. Yep. But you've earned yeah. it. You've earned that space now. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you. Whenever people ask me like, what does it mean? You know, my successes and where I've come. I always think about my grandmother. You know, a mm. hundred years and what she's seen and what she thought she'd never see. You know mm. what I mean? Mm. You know, mm. the thing that she thought she would never live to see. So I always think about her like, God, my grandma can go in the store and say that is a part of my lineage. The idea that you are now an entrepreneur, is that something that your family's like wrapping their heads around? Do they understand as you're, you know, how does how does that work? How does that feel with your family? They're just always so proud, you know, and I'm very conscious of making them proud, you know, because I was the inner city kid. I was the kid that I had all the odds stacked against me because all my cousins grew up in homes and nice suburban neighborhoods. I was the inner city kid. So, you know, um, I think there was a fear there that I would I would end up in the streets, you know, but my mother did such a great job, like I said, where keeping me like I would be hanging out Shaquanda and Peaches and Man Man and them. <laughs> <laughs> on the weekdays, and then on the weekends, I would be with Mary Beth and Brock and Josh, and you know, we would go to the <laughs> rink, you know. <laughs> yes, we learned how to do that, how to code shift, how to code switch. Yeah. We know how to do it. And, and another beautiful thing she did was every summer she sent me down south to, you know, mm. my spend time with my grandmother, and that's where I was my most creative because there was nothing down there. Nothing mm. like when the lights, when the sun went down, you could not see your hand in front of your face. So all I uh-huh. had was time to create and be imaginative and dream. And because mm. I had no other kids down there to play with, so I hung out with all my grandmother and her friend. That's why I, I can tap and and um, access Southern women when I play them really well because I grew up watching them and hanging out with them. <laughs> I'd be the mm. only kid. In- <laughs> Tell me what holidays were like in your house with you and your mom. Did you have a favorite holiday? 
Christmas. Christmas is my all time oh. favorite, favorite holiday. Still is to this day. Is it so I fun to have a movie that comes out on Christmas when that's your it, favorite it holiday? <laughs> it is, it is, it is. Um, I, one would call me a Christmas nerd. I mean, a lot really? of people might not know this about, yeah, I collect Christmas villages and no. I add on to them. Yeah, I add on to them every year. My tree is in, it's not your typical tree. It's kind of very different. Um, and this is how tight my family is. Yeah, my t- my family's so tight. They, my cousin knows that I collect these villages because I got it from my aunt. I remember going to my aunt's house and she would have this beautiful display. And I'm like, when I start making money, I want one of those. And so me and her talk about our Christmas village. But she's like, girl, you done took it to a whole nother level. <laughs> Do you have a whole room for your Christmas villages now? <laughs> well, actually, I my tree is not a typical tree. It's the shape sort of like of a tree, but it's these wooden circular discs and they start large and they go all the way up until they're small. <gasps> And that's um, the on the circular discs and where I put the villages. Each layer has a theme. Then there's the town. Then there's where you go shopping all the way up to the North Pole where Santa is. And then I have oh it. All goodness. of my characters are black. Amen. And if they're not, I paint their faces. I'm sorry. <laughs> black and unlimited. <laughs> Let it, let's hear it. For more information about Black-led brands, products, and my memoir, Thicker Than Water, visit walmart.com slash black and unlimited. So was it like that as a kid? Was your mom very into Christmas too? Or did you push yeah. that in the home? Like what? So we always went south to my grandma's house, the entire family. We would pick up, everybody would pack up and drive down south and we would all where, come Where in the south? In um, North Carolina, Scotland Neck, North Carolina, small little town, very small. And but that's where my mother and her siblings grew up. And um, so we all convened down there and we have like family game night. We have Secret Santa. You know, mm. everybody cooks, we eat, we dance. It, the kids play until our hair is like this um, and our socks are hanging off our feet. Um, <laughs> We just had, you know, and then at the end of the night, they would put make a big pallet on the floor and all the cousins sleep on the pallet, you know, so mm. we're very close family. And this year, for the first time in a long time, we're all gathering again, you know, because now we're all grown and we all have our kids. So we would kind of do Christmas in our own little places. Right. And right. so this year is like the first year that we're kind of like all getting together Um because of the movie and everything. And so I'm so excited because we're talking about family game night. And I just wow. love that we're passing this closeness down to our kids, you know? Yeah. That's so funny because I was going to ask you, if you think about that house on Livingston, is there one thing from that house that you would bring into your current life now? Around Christmas, I would always get those big catalogs and look through the toy section and be like, I want yes. this, I want this. Circle the if things. We had money. If we had money, I would get this and that. I remember as a little girl, I said, when I have money, one day when I start making my money, I'm going to have my little girl room and I'm going to put everything in there that I want. And so when people come over my house, they tease me because they're like, you have a square? Like I have a register. I don't have any. I'm not selling anything, but that's my little girl room. And like when I was a kid, I would play with little cash registers and now I have a real one. And you know, <laughs> I love and it's that just because for me. Like, it's just what for a me. beautiful way to really honor your inner child, like to honor the yeah. little Taraji and who she is and what she needs. Mm-hmm. That is amazing. Wow. Yeah. If you could go back in time and tell that little girl something, what would you want to go back and say to little Taraji? I would just say to her, you're you're going to do a great job in the and you're going to do some amazing things in in the future and just don't change a thing. Just just stay true to who you are because you're going to be incredible. So if your story was going to start once upon a time, finish that sentence for me. Once upon a time in the southeast D.C., there lived a little girl named Taraji who had big, big, big dreams. And one day she grew up and she believed in those dreams and she made them come true. (laughs) (laughs) Woo! 
Yeah. Because yes. everything starts with a dream. You know, that's what I tell yeah. the kids. No yeah. one can steal your dream. I don't care what circumstances you are in. You have to have a dream. No one can take those dreams from you. Do you think there was something about that first garden apartment on Livingston that made dreaming okay for you? Oh, absolutely. I would have to say my mother and the environment that she established for me because she allowed me, but that room, I, oh God, the things that I did in that room, I was a principal, I was a teacher, I was a musician. And my mother would be literally sitting on the sofa while she loved Clint Eastwood and Little House on the Prairie. So on the weekends, that's where she was binge watching. And I would come in there with my doll babies and teddy bears and she'd be sitting there watching TV. And by the end of her show, it's a whole row of doll babies lined up. She didn't even know that she was the principal and these are the kids that were acting up in the class. She was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she gave you room to dream and play my father as well he said he can remember as um i was as young as two and i would make him get on all fours because I, when i would go over his house i didn't have all my toys and everything so i would make him be the sink and he would be watching the game or the fight and he would be on all fours and he said i'd be going shh, shh, like washing dishes and <laughs> So I, I, I have it. I owe it to my parents. They allowed, they nurtured this creative imagination that I had. My mm. entire family, I would go to our family gatherings and I would put together a whole talent show. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's so, it's really beautiful to hear about your once upon a time because what you've created in your life is this like really beautiful world of giving back and providing mental health support and self-care to our community. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really inspiring to hear where it started. As a mom, it's really inspiring to hear how those things got instilled in you early on. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm proud of you for being so vulnerable with your book. Just thank oh. you. Thank you, Taraji. Yeah, I always Thank say you. if you have a story to tell, tell it because someone out there needs to hear it. Someone out there needs to see themselves and they need to know that they're not alone. So thank you because we all we got, mama. <laughs> Amen. I'm so grateful to Taraji for coming on Street You Grew Up On and telling us all about growing up on Livingston Road. I think it's very clear that her connection to the community on Livingston Road and also all the creativity that was fostered there is part of what led her to being the amazing artist and entrepreneur that she is today. So if you haven't already, go see Taraji in the color purple. And if you want to shop Taraji's TPH hair care line and so many other amazing products, go to walmart.com slash black and unlimited. You can also pick up my memoir there, Thicker Than Water. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure that you like and subscribe and we'll see you back here soon.